The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Psalm 62 this morning. We'll be reading verses 5 through 12 of Psalm 62. Psalm 62, beginning with verse 5. For God alone my soul waits in silence. My hope is from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their works. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, May we hear what you would have us to hear. May we do, Lord, what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, from time to time as a preacher, and I've been doing this now, I started thinking about it the other day, for almost 15 years. But from time to time as a preacher, you come across one of those stories that preachers love to tell. Maybe uh, they heard a popular preacher tell it one time on the radio long ago. Maybe they heard a seminary professor say it one time in chapel. Or maybe, uh, as is often the case these days, they found it on the internet. Uh, But whatever the case, there are those stories that preachers do love to tell and retell. And one that comes to my mind this morning is a story that's attributed to the late Dr. Hayden Robinson. Dr. Robinson was a professor of preaching and former president of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary up in Massachusetts. Dr. Robinson uh, was born in New York City, but this story he tells uh, strikes home with me because it's about a Baptist evangelist from Alabama, a preacher by the name of Monroe Parker. Any of you ever heard of Monroe Parker? There's no reason you should have. You'd have to be at least 100 years old. But the story goes that Reverend Parker was traveling through South Alabama. Now, if you remember my comments from last week, there's South Alabama and Mobile. I'm talking about South Alabama. And he was traveling through South Alabama on one of those those days late in the summer that folks down in those parts of the country call the dog days of summer. It's one of those hot, sticky days, you know what I mean, the kind of days where you couldn't walk out to the mailbox without your t-shirt sticking to your back. And Reverend Parker was, well, he was parched, famished, thirsty. And as he went on down the road, he came across a man who was selling watermelons on the side of the road. Now, this isn't an unusual sight even today in South Alabama. I grew up, I knew quite a few folks who'd have a little watermelon patch, and after they'd pick them, which is, by the way, the second hottest job in the world right after volcanic scientist. It's a watermelon picker. And they'd load them in a wagon or maybe in a trailer or in the back of their truck and they'd park somewhere alongside the highway, usually beside a service station, maybe even sit on the tailgate with their feet swinging. And as the story goes that this Reverend Parker strolled up on one of these men selling watermelons on the side of the road and asked how much would it take to buy one? Well, the man said, they're a dollar and ten cents a piece. And so Reverend Parker started feeling around in his pants, trying to look around in his pockets, trying to come up with one dollar and one dime. But all he could come up with was a dollar. So he held out his hand to the man and said, all I have is a dollar. To which the man replied, that's all right, I'll trust you for it. And so as the story goes, 
Reverend Parker put the dollar back in his pocket, picked out a watermelon, proceeded to walk off, to carry it off to eat it when the man shouted back, hey, hey, what do you think you're doing? Where are you going with that? Reverend Parker said something, well, I'm going to go over and eat that catawba tree, cut it up, and I'm going to eat this watermelon. The man said, but you forgot to give me the dollar. And Reverend Parker said, well, you said you'd trust me for it. The man said, yeah, yeah, but I meant I'd trust you for the dime, <laughs> not the dollar. To which, as Dr. Robinson's telling goes, uh, the evangelist looked at the man and said, Mac, you weren't going to trust me at all. You were just going to take a 10-cent gamble on my integrity. Today, that story is probably close to 100 years old, but it testifies to, re to a reality of the human experience that I think is more real in our current culture than perhaps at any other time in recent human history. Because you see, we live in a world in which trust is becoming a very rare commodity. A world in which we are less likely to trust someone for a dime, never mind a dollar. It's difficult to have trust in much of anything lately. I mean, we're living in a time when a day can't go by without hearing about some celebrity, some athlete, some politician who's been unfaithful or committed a crime or has been hiding something from the public for years. We live in an era when the very people we're supposed to be able to trust, physicians, ministers, elected officials. These people constantly and consistently let us down as we hear story after story that erodes our culturally created confidence in these authorities. I mean, just this week, I'm sure you heard the story of a former U.S. Olympic gymnastics team doctor who pleaded guilty to federal child pornography charges but then uh, more than 125 women and girls came forward and accused him of sexual misconduct. Many of them were U.S. Olympic gymnasts. He was supposed to be a medical miracle worker, a trusted doctor who would help these injured athletes recover quickly and get back to doing what they love to do. But instead, he used his position of power and influence and authority to abuse young girls and women who were simply trying to live out their dreams through their hard work and God-given talent. We're supposed to be able to trust these kind of people, right? To trust our physicians. And then, then over the last decade or more, there are these countless stories of young boys and girls who have been taken advantage of by those who wear clerical collars or stand behind pulpits to preach. In fact, just this month, a pastor at a megachurch in Memphis confessed to the congregation there that he had had a, quote, sexual incident with a 17-year-old girl when he was the youth pastor at a church in Texas. And the congregation gave him a standing ovation. But for the rest of us outside of that room that morning, it was just another reason to withhold our trust from another person in whom we should be able to put our confidence. And of course, I don't have enough time to even list the number of ways various politicians and elected officials and leaders in our various forms of government have corroded our trust. Whether it's an overwhelming number of denied allegations, audio tapes, emails, their own words, far too many of our leaders have a consistent track record of malicious misdirection when it comes to our trust and confidence in them to lead. Who are we supposed to trust? We're supposed to be able to trust these people, supposed to be able to trust the institutions they represent. We're supposed to be able to feel safe in their care, under their direction and leadership. We're supposed to be able to place our trust in those whose expertise, experience, and vocation have given them the authority and opportunity to serve in roles of service and stewardship. But time and time again, these days, almost daily, we are let down, let down by their faults, let down by their egos, let down by their ignorance, let down by their own sense of self-preservation. And so I can't help but wonder, maybe you have too, will there ever be a time when we can place our trust in those who occupy positions of power and influence and authority? Was there ever really 
and we could trust those kinds of folks. Of course, I, I know in my own life there are those who seem to have come out of the womb skeptical. Those among, among us who place their trust not in given authorities or individuals or institutions, but in themselves, in the earned outcome of their hard work, determinations, and ability. They place their trust in their ability to persevere, their own self-perception as one who can overcome any challenge without even the slightest bit of assistance. They trust in their own physical strength, their own work ethic, their own skills, and they believe fully that those are enough to get them over any challenge, that those are enough to get them by in this world until reality proves otherwise. I've lived a great deal of my life around these sorts of folks. Most of them have my same last name and share a great deal of my DNA and what I have witnessed through them is that often our own strengths, our own determination to persevere can be overcome by the relentless hardships of reality and the never-ending and always rising costs of life. What I have learned is that all the hard work, skill, and grit in the world cannot stay the hand of time, nor can it ward off the inevitable things like cancer. What I have learned is that to put one's trust and his or her own strengths is to put our trust in a bucket with a rusted bottom. So where do we place our trust? Who can we trust? If we can't trust ourselves, if we can't trust these institutions, these people who occupy these positions of power, if we can't, if we can't trust the institutions we've created, if we can't trust our own powers and ability, then what or who can we trust? Who has the ultimate power? In whom or what do we find an ultimate purpose, or as Paul Tillich would say, our ground of being? I hope that you're sitting in this room that the answer might be more than obvious. But if we listen to the voice of the psalmist this morning, we find the answer. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from him. This psalmist is singing, uh, some scholars say that this psalm was written as sort of a, a plea of defense. That when the, the judges and the, and the tribes of the air couldn't come to a, a, a determine, uh, to a verdict, they would be brought into the temple and placed before the priest, and the accused would sing a psalm like this. Not to get off the hook, not to, but to say, I don't care the outcome, I'm singing this because I place my trust not even in this institution ordained by God, but in God, God's self. And so the psalmist sings, places his trust in God, not in the personalities posturing for political power, not in the insular institutions insisting on protecting the status quo, not even in the psalmist's own personal resolve to endure whatever hardships through which he finds himself going. The only one worthy of the psalmist's trust is the one who is beyond all comprehension and understanding. The one next to whom the psalmist says, the low of a state are but a breath, and those of higher state are a delusion. And so the psalmist sings, on God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Not in anything else. Not in anything else that might have the evidence laid in front of you to say this is it. On God. And so he says to the people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Put no confidence in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your hearts on them. The exhortation is to rest fully and completely on God. To trust God at all times, no matter what those times may bring. To not place our trust even in those things that seem themselves to be evidence of their trustworthiness. To not place our trust in the things that give us evidence that says we ought to trust in them. In other words, even if placing your trust in others, in institutions, in yourself, in old habits, in the way things have always been, or in your own personality, even if all of those things have led you to a life of comfort and ease, it does not warrant your trust to be placed in anything outside of God, God's self. Now, I suppose 
at first hearing, that sounds kind of like church business as usual, doesn't it? Well, duh. Of course we're supposed to trust God. Can't we just sing the invitation and go home? But the truth is, when it comes down to it, and I mean when it really comes down to it, trusting God doesn't make a lick of sense. It doesn't. After all, I can see the works of my hands. I can put in a week's worth of work and hold a paycheck at the end of the week and go, see, see. I can sit across the table from another human being or at least get an email from someone in his or her office. I can hold money in my hands. I can possess the deed and the keys to my house, the title to my car. I have the skill and the knowledge to earn a living, to earn a paycheck in any number of ways imaginable should the need present itself. I can verify and authenticate references. I can run background checks. I can do a Google search on any of us that don't do one on me. You'll find basketball players and stuff. That's not me. I didn't live a formula. Or I can simply look someone right in the eye when I ask them a question. But not God. So why in the world would I put my trust in a God I can't see and a God who who I can't look in the eye. Why in the world would I place my trust in a God whose voice I've never audibly heard and who doesn't even have an email address? Why should I place my trust in God? Because the truth is, when everything else fails, and it will fail, everything, even the institution of this church, even even me as your pastor, even the institution, of family, everything, everything will fail. It will. And when everything else fails, God won't. Because there will come those times in, in your life when nothing will pull your life out of a tailspin. There will come times in your life when nothing else will bring you up from rock bottom. And here's the thing. I'm not going to tell you that God does it. I'm not going to tell you that God's going to correct the course and pull you out. You know what I know, though? That when your life is spinning and you hit rock bottom, God spins right with you. And God finds you right there at the bottom, too. So why trust God? Because God is there with you, whether you like it or not. God is there with you, and as I hope you're reminded every week, there's nothing you can do about it. God's there with you, riding the waves of life's reckless rhythms with you. When you look to put your trust in those things that you hope will deliver you, God is in the midst of the very thing from which you hope to be delivered. And that's the whole point of the cross, isn't it? The cross tells us that God has left the power of heaven to dwell in the dirt of the earth, to bear the pains, frustration, heartaches, and joys of life that we experience. The cross tells us that God deserves our trust, not because God is some heavenly being on a throne who has the power to pick us up and move us around, but because God, God bears this life with us. Sure, the psalmist may sing, Once God has spoken, twice have I heard that power belongs to God. And if we could stop there, that's a great song. That's a great sermon. Power belongs to God, isn't it great? And yeah, the psalmist may mean that he has heard of the power of God to shake the mountains and crush his enemies. But can I tell you something? I don't want a God that can shake mountains and crush enemies. I don't need a God who can black out the sun and shake the mountains and part the waters and crush enemies. Because I believe there's a greater power. A greater power that alone is worthy of our trust. And the psalmist testifies even to that power when he sings, And steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord. That greatest power is captured in that Hebrew word that our English language can't quite wrap itself around. The power alone that is worthy of our trust is the power of God's chesed. The power of God's unfailing, limitless Reckless love. The sort of love that follows us all of life's peaks and valleys, all the way. The sort of love that walks alongside us even in the presence, in the present pace of life's predicament. 
It's the sort of love that goes on ahead of us into an unseen future. The sort of love that proves its trustworthiness, not, not in the power to crack open the earth, not in the power to crush enemies, not in the power to deliver us from oppression, to bring us up into riches and glory. No, it is a power that is proven in the image of one who hangs on a cross, who's broken and dying, just like us. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, you alone are worthy of our trust. Lord, you alone are worthy of anything we ever have to give, including all of who we are. And Lord, while we know that Scripture testifies to your power and your majesty, your glory and your might, we know, Lord, that it is made full and real. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. And in the love that you express through emptying yourself on a cross, even to the point of death. God, help us to realize that the things of this world are not worthy of our trust, but only you, God. And that the things in which we trust, in you, that you are calling us to bear witness to it, to the rest of this world. So Holy God, speak to us now. Show us your presence and your loving Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name.